Silver Hills Community Church on this Lord's Day. We want to welcome everybody and we welcome those of you who are joining us uh, as well, uh, streaming, live streaming. Uh, this is the Lord's Day and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all come on in. There's plenty of seats. Let's have a seat and prepare to meet with the Lord this morning. Uh, and uh, let's go to him in prayer. And then we will begin our time of singing and worship together. And we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we have drifted away from you this week. And so now, Lord, we take steps to draw near to you. We want to hear you, Lord. We want to listen to you. We want to obey you. We want to learn this morning, Father, we pray. Help us, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start this morning as Nikki reads for us an introduction to our first song. The hymn, His Mercy is More, written by Matt Boswell and Matt Papa, was inspired by a pastoral letter written by John Newton in 1799, in which he said, Are not you amazed sometimes that you should have so much as a hope, that poor and needy as you are, the Lord thinks of you? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together as we say, Mercy is more what love could be made, no wrongs could be done. He counts not their son. Let's see, Catherine. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Chasing a Task Unfinished, first penned by China Inland Mission worker Frank Houghton at a time when persecution in China was at its height. Facing a Task Unfinished has been a rally cry for missions in the Pacific Rim for many years. In 1929, the Lord laid a vision on the heart of the China Inland Mission. Leader to see 200 million plunge into the darkness and share the light of Christ, not well cost them their lives. As he reflected on Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 14, to bear the torch of the gospel to all nations, his heart was broken for the people of China, and he wrote this hymn. Let's sing together, Facing a Task Unfinished. We're going to continue in worship as Phil Brady comes and leads us and prepares us to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper together. Uh, Phil? Pardon? 
Good deal. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, we know that uh, it's also called the Lord's Table, uh, the Lord's Blessing, and then, of course, uh, the Eucharist, or giving of thanks. The Apostle Paul tells us the institution of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, a loaf of it, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Um, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after uh, saying, this cup is the, my favorite part, the new covenant in his blood. It's only two laws now that we have to follow, not 700. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's suffering, um, the Lord's, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. All right, here we go. There's the kicker. Only those who are born again should participate in the Lord's Supper and communion. How do you know whether or not you are born again? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and by your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in me will not be put to shame. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, and I love this, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Pray with me. Um, as we uh, bow our heads, I want you to think about where you stand with Christ right now. We know that um, if you've repented and received Christ, your sins are forgiven. Uh, it drives me crazy when people constantly go back to the forgiveness issue. You're already forgiven. If you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, knock it off. I, right? Right. It's, it's really not that difficult. Okay, so uh, pray with me. Lord, from uh, Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, uh, and for everyone here and for our sake, uh, Lord, search us and know our hearts. Try us. Know our anxieties. See if there be any wicked way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. So as we respect social distancing, uh, will, you, will you please come up and uh, Catherine will be playing a song and uh, grab a cup and grab a uh, cracker and uh, please return to your seats. Thank you.
all stand together as we continue our time of worship and Phil will come up after the song is over and lead us as we partake of the Lord's Supper together as a church family. Catherine, would you lead us in a wonderful, merciful Savior? Please hold the bread and the cup until Phil comes and, and leads us as we partake together. What you doing with my paper? Oh, your paper right here. Yeah, it's like, I don't know Okay. All right. Once, now that we are finished collecting our elements. All right. Here we go. Let's see here. Okay. In the same way, uh, he took the cup after supper. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Um, whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And I usually should do the bread first, but I didn't. All right, and Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And let me close in prayer. And this prayer is uh, actually from Alistair Begg. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you, O most holy Lord Almighty, Father, eternal God. You have deigned, not through any of our merits, but of, out of your own condescension, of your goodness to satisfy us as sinners, your unworthy servants, with the precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love what you have done for us. 
what you've given to us, what you've sacrificed for us, a price unequaled. And um, we pray all these things through our uh, same Christ and our Lord. Amen. 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 Let's continue in our worship this morning. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let's sing together this new hymn that Catherine has been introducing to us. King of Kings, King of Kings. Catechism, and today we're in question number four. Nikki? Question number four. How and why did God create us? And together we answer, God, God created, created us male and female in his own image to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. 
This is from Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to worship you and to love you. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you are glorified this morning in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on up here. Come up here. I got some things to show you. Let's have a seat. All right. Let me get my paper over there, will you? Um, let me grab those. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad that you're here. You guys remember the box from last week? Notice this. I put my label on my box here, but I didn't mark whether it was a boy or, wh or whether it was a girl. But my box is a boy, isn't it? Do you remember that from last week, Mason? Though I got a pink hat in there. They, they thought it was for a girl, but there's cars in there as well for Operation Christmas Child. And you know what? Here is a letter, and this young fellow right here, 20 some years ago, he received one of these boxes from Sydney. And Sydney was your age 20 some years ago. And you know what he did? He wrote back a letter to Sydney, and this letter came from the Philippines. And so what Sydney did, she put a picture of herself in the box, and she wrote a letter, and she put it in there with her address, and they wrote her back and sent her a picture. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. Operation Christmas Child. You guys remember that? We need, we got 50 boxes over here that we're going to do this year for Christmas time. And you know, a week before Thanksgiving, that's when we have to have them in. All right? So there's a deadline so that we can send the boxes to the kids overseas. We are looking at everything a child should know about God. Do you guys remember this? Everything a child should know about God? You know, Emma, you remember this, don't you, honey? Yeah. Our little book here, and we've got a lesson in here today, all right? And I'll show you the picture of the lesson today. This is not really a nice one, because look at the young fellow. What's he doing in the store? He's stealing. He's what? He's stealing. He's stealing. He's taking something that is not his. He didn't pay for it. And if there was a policeman there, the policeman could arrest him and put him in jail, right? Yeah. Well, you know what? Our lesson here is that God is holy. This means that God never does anything wrong. And he always does what is right. No one else is holy like God. For all of us have sinned, which means we have done the things wrong, but God is perfect. The boy in the picture is taking something which is not his. This is wrong. God does not make mistakes. Who is holy and never does anything wrong? Our Heavenly Father. He always does what is right and never does what is wrong. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning and thank you for these children. Thank you for the parents and the adults and the grandmas and the grandpas listening here. And Lord, we thank you that because of Jesus, we can be holy. We do not have to do what is wrong. We do not have to steal. We can tell the truth. We can be honest. And Lord, we ask that you would help all of us be holy like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So off to Sunday school you go. All righty. Welcome, everybody. I want to welcome you here this morning, and I want to ask Jeff, if Jeff, if you would come forward, and uh, Jeff is going to introduce our guests this morning, uh, make certain that uh, if he doesn't introduce his wife, that you do, and so oh, that, all right, I, you know, I, you I, will, I, all right, so we have a guest uh, this morning, uh, uh, Tim and Tina Carnes, and so I just want to ask uh, Jeff to kind of introduce them to us, Jeff. Well, you just said their name, so Tim and Tina Carnes. Uh, Chris and I were reflecting uh, last night, and these two know us uh, when we were first married better than anyone else, even our parents. Uh, and in many ways, God used these two people, <laughs> sorry, to grow us, to shape us, to point us to Jesus. 
And I'm so thankful for you too. Sorry. <laughs> God uses many, many people in our lives, doesn't he? And Tim and Tina have been those spiritual fathers and mothers to us. <laughs> they pointed us to the means in which we got our beautiful daughters. They pointed us towards Christ to shape our marriage and form our marriage. And we are entirely grateful for that. Tim was pastor at the church that we were at for the first three years of our marriage, uh, Calvary Bible Church. You can still find his messages, uh, excellent series on the book of Ephesians. I just looked it up this morning, and I'm going to go through it yet again. Uh, so if you love what you hear from Tim, you can go to Calvary Bible Church in Burbank and find his sermons. Uh, he transitioned into a missions role uh, shortly after, uh, after those three years as the main teaching pastor he became an associate. I respect this man greatly. His full-time ministry now is training pastors around the world to preach the word of God. He's training pastors to shepherd people. If that's not impact for the advancement of the gospel of God, I don't know what is. And the Lord has seen fit to bring this incredible couple here today, this morning, and for Tim to bring the word of God, I think from Jonah, right? I'm looking forward to it. So, Pastor Tim, if you would come on up and bring the word. I don't know that I've ever had anyone cry introducing me. <laughs> I have had a lot of people cry after they've heard me preach. but uh... So, thank you, Jeff. That's heartfelt and... Uh... We greatly appreciate you as well and your family. Wish Krista could be here. I know one of the children is sick, so she wasn't able to make it. Well, <clears throat> try to follow that <clears throat> up. Um, our focus this weekend has been on having a uh, mission mindset. How do we cultivate that as a church? Uh, this morning, for those of you who are able to make it this morning, we focused on a mission-minded motivation. That is, what, what can motivate us to have a a mission mindset. And again, I use the word mission singular because we want to focus on his mission and that will lead to then missions around the world. Um, there's a few reasons we looked at this morning from the life of the Apostle Paul. I want to consider one more motivation and this is actually a motivation for God's own example. What motivates God on this mission that he has set for us? And we find one great example of that motivation, as Jeff mentioned, in the book of Jonah. So I'd ask you to turn there with me to the book of Jonah. Now, I understand, I know this is one of the most well-known stories in the Bible um, that we have, the book of Jonah. In fact, when I say Jonah, what comes to your mind? Well, yeah, right? Being swallowed by the whale. Uh, and, I, you know, that's the story that gets all of the press. But do you realize, out of the whole book of Jonah, only three of the 48 verses have to do with him being in that whale. Um, indeed, the central message of the book of Jonah goes far deeper, pun intended, than the fish. But also, it's far more important than just to focus on Jonah. In fact, Jonah really isn't the central character in this story as we're going to see as we look through it together. But before we get to that, I want to just have us reflect and see how well we remember this story. How does the story begin? Well, look with me uh, at verse 1, Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so that's what it does, right? Yes, I'm on the first train out of here. Bring the fire, right? Is that what he did? No. no. Right? Look at verse 3. Jonah, he rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So the book begins with an amazing irony, a prophet who refuses to prophesy. What is up with that? You see, God wanted Jonah to go to the northeast, to Assyria, to Nineveh, present-day Mosul, and instead he goes southwest, down to Joppa, and then he gets on a boat to go to Tarshish, which I believe uh, was referring to the area of Spain. And notice it repeats it three times, Tarshish. Why? He wanted to get out as far away as he could as possible. The question is, why? 
God gives him a direct command to go to the Assyrians, that, that race of people that were very violent, v- wicked. In fact, it says here they're evil, had risen up to the Lord to the point that God wanted to send an Israeli prophet to go tell them they're in trouble. And yet he refuses, and he runs off in the opposite direction. Now, a question comes up. I'm going to ask a lot of these as we go through the story. Why did Jonah not just stay home? I mean, he said, God, I'm not going. I'm staying here. I'm going to continue watching Netflix. Just forget what you asked me to do. Why did he run? It says he fled. He fled to Joppa, then got on a ship. That's an important question. Why does he go to the trouble of taking the 60-mile journey to get to Joppa and then get on the ship that was going to take him another 1,200 or so miles away from Israel? Well, notice it says in verse 3, twice, Jonah wanted to flee from the Lord. Now, certainly Jonah understood the, the theme of Psalm 139, right? There, one of the themes in Psalm 139. You cannot escape from God's sight, right? I think here he's wanting to escape from God's service. He wants out of there. I'm done being your prophet. And now is where it gets interesting. What's God going to do? <laughs> Verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break it up. Now, I want to stop there. In the verses that follow, right, there's this whole discussion among the sailors as to what's happening, and, and the captain saying, everybody, cry out to your gods, and he goes to Jonah and tells Jonah, cry out to your God, and Jonah, right, that's the last person he wants to talk to at that point. And so they find out uh, who he is, right, that, that they ask him the question, who are you? He says, I serve the God of the earth and the heaven and the sea, and that's when they really get scared. They go, uh-oh, what did you do? And so, of course, they throw him overboard at Jonah's suggestion, and then the sea is calm immediately. Kind of reminds us of another time, doesn't it? On another sea. We're calmed immediately, and those sailors were, then they really got scared. Like, whoa, this God is for real. And then, of course, comes a great miracle in the book, right? As Jonah is sinking toward the bottom of the Mediterranean, a large fish, and I believe it was a large fish, that's the Hebrew word, Dagesh, fish, swallows him up, and the miracle is not that he was swallowed by a fish. It's that he was alive inside of that fish, right? An interesting side note, as I was studying this book, uh, there were a couple of liberal scholars that indicated that, the, that actually Jonah wasn't swallowed by a literal fish, but he went to a place called the Fish Inn. <laughs> Kid you not. <laughs> Anything to dispute a miracle, right? They'll even make stuff up. But that's not what happened. In any case, chapter 2 gives us this poem from Jonah as he is inside of the fish. And then verse 10 of chapter 2, take a look there. The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. And then chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Let's stop there a minute. Okay, so picture the scene, right? Jonah's been inside of the fish, sitting in that stomach acid and the seaweed and all the other stuff in there, right? Sorry to be graphic, but hey, it says the word vomit here in the text, so, right? So then what happens? God prompts the fish, vomits him out on the beach, maybe somewhere near where he got on the ship. We don't know for sure. And picture Jonah there in that moment. He's got seaweed hanging from him. He's probably, the skin's probably pale from being in the fish his stomach for a while. He probably doesn't smell too good. I don't know how much sleep he got. Doesn't say, but then God says, okay, Jonah, now, are you ready to go? (laughs) This time, (laughs) yes. So Jonah decides to go. He takes the 500 mile or so journey up through the desert. Usually it would take a couple of months uh, to get there. Travels up to Nineveh. And then we read in verse uh, 3, of Jonah chapter 3. Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, how would the people respond to this? And these are uh, ruthless, Assyrian, pagan, idol-worshiping Gentiles that demonstrated, and I, can't, I won't even go into the details of how they treated their enemies. Uh, suffice to say, one, one example is the cross, the crucifixion, was something that is believed to have derived from the way the Assyrians would impale people upon 
sticks when they would conquer their cities. But they did many other terrible things. So how would they respond to this Jewish prophet coming from one of these subjugated nations to this message? What does verse 5 say? The people of Nineveh believed. <laughs> they believed in God. They called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, why did he do that? That was an ancient Near Eastern practice of demonstrating humility and remorse and mourning and, and the recognition that trouble's coming. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So here we see, this is amazing. I mean, I don't think we can appreciate it because we didn't live in those days. We didn't see what these people did or how they thought about the one true God. They believe, not only that, they demonstrate the genuineness of that belief by how they responded with repent, acts of repentance, putting on sackcloth and ashes. And I don't, you know, this is one of the greatest revivals, I think, seen in Scripture. I mean, Billy Graham never saw an entire city come to Christ, did he? This is amazing. <laughs> and so what does God do in response? Verse 10, chapter 3. When God saw... What they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So he shows mercy. So I step back a minute. Here in these first three chapters, it's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? A prophet who, who rejects the commission to go, uh, the calming of the sea, Jonah's obedience to Nineveh, the Ninevites' repentance, and we have a fish no longer suffering from indigestion. I mean, it's a great story. But as we look at our Bibles, it doesn't end there, does it? I mean, wasn't that the mission? Didn't God tell Jonah, go to the Ninevites? And he didn't go at first, then he went, he goes, they repent, everything's great, happily ever after. But that's not the end of the story. Notice, there's more given, chapter 4. And there should really be, now just pretend this was the first time you heard this story, all right? I don't think probably anybody is, that's the case. But just pretend there should be a nagging question in our minds. Why in the world did Jonah refuse to go? I mean, he must have known he was taking quite a risk by rejecting God's direct commandment. In fact, there was a prophet in 1 Kings 13 when he disobeyed the Lord, a lion found him and ate him up. Certainly Jonah probably may have heard of that story, being a prophet, I'm sure that was passed on. <laughs> So the prophets don't, but he did anyway. Why? Was he afraid? Knowing how these ruthless Assyrians treated their enemies, was he fearing that, oh, if I go, I'm going to be tortured and killed? And he knew how they would do that. Was it, uh, maybe he just, this is a long trip, and they're not going to respond to me. That, why should I go? I mean, that was a hard journey. Maybe he was just tired. Maybe he was lazy. Maybe the, the Netflix series he was watching was so engrossing he wanted to continue. I, I don't know. And that's the issue. Whatever it was, was a big enough issue for him to directly disobey God and ref not only refuse to go, but actually run the opposite direction. Why did he do it? That's why we have chapter 4. And that's what directs us to the whole point of this story. Look with me at verse 1, chapter 4. But it, and that is from verse 10, God's response of mercy, it pleased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. This is interesting. What the author reveals to us here is actually there was a conversation at the very beginning between Jonah and the Lord. A conversation that the author chose not to let us know about until this point. And Jonah here reveals to us that he said, Lord, didn't I tell you this when you first told me to go? I know who you are. I know you're compassionate. I know you're slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, just as you 
uh, showed to our father Moses and described to him in Exodus 34, I know this about you. I know what you're doing. You're not sending me on a mission to declare judgment. You're sending me on a mission to declare a warning. You want to give these people another chance, don't you? To put it bluntly, why did Jonah not want to go? He wanted these pagan Gentiles to burn in hell. And here in Jonah's complaint, that's why Jonah's angry. Why was he angry? They listened to his message. They repented. Again, I mean, if we had seen something like that, imagine yourself getting up and preaching to the city here in Carson City, and everyone Are you going to be mad <laughs> that God doesn't bring judgment? He was. Wow. Where was Jonah's heart's at? heart at? Where was his heart at? That brings us to the point of this story, the theme of it, and really a key theme in all of Scripture, and that is this. God is a God of compassion, God of mercy. We see that all through the book of Jonah. Go back with me to chapter 1. Where do we first see his compassion? On the sailors. I want you to think about this. Ask yourself this question. Was that storm on the Mediterranean for Jonah, or was it for the sailors? At any point in time, God could have dealt with Jonah for his rebellion, right? He was on a 60-mile journey, walking down into Joppa. Again, he could have commissioned that lion to show up again, as he did before. Snakes, robbers, uh, heat, many opportunities to deal with Jonah then. But God waits, and he waits for Jonah to get on that ship. And then after he gets on the ship and they set sail, the storm comes. Notice, by the way, in chapter 1, there are more verses giving attention to the sailors than to Jonah. There's more dialogue. What, what, what's with all that dialogue with the sailors? Why does that matter? Why is that important? If it's all about God dealing with Jonah, I think 11 of the 17 verses in the first chapter are talk about the sailors or include their dialogue. Only five or six regarding Jonah. And so, right, he's on a ship, there's this big storm, they cast lots, the lot happens to fall upon Jonah as the source of their trouble. So God is clearly, he's directing attention to Jonah. Why? Because he's angry with Jonah, wants to punish him? Or is he trying to meet the sailors where they are at? Who controls this water that you regularly travel on? He's thrown overboard. The sea grows calm, and then it hits him, just like it hit Peter in the boat at the Sea of Galilee when he said, my Lord and my God. He, he, he fell down and said, get out of this boat, Jesus, because we're not worthy to have you in our presence. Why? He knew who Jesus was at that moment. Jesus got his attention as that fisherman, and in the very same way, he got these sailors' attention. There is one true God. And notice how they respond in verse 16 of chapter 1. It says they greatly feared the Lord and offered sacrifice and made vow to him. Now some uh, scholars dismiss this as just a, a, a response of ignorant pagans to some deity, but I think this is a demonstration of a, a genuine belief and trust in the one true God. Notice Yahweh, his personal name is used twice. They didn't say to Jonah's God or to the God of Israel or the God of the sea, but they directed their attention to Yahweh the one true God. And notice it says there that they feared him. This was a fear of reverence and awe and of worship. Why? Because they offered sacrifices and made vows. This was not just some, okay, we can add one more God to our pantheon of gods. No, this is the one, this is the true God. Look what he just did. I think the first chapter is more about God using Jonah, despite Jonah, <laughs> Him bringing Jonah to the sailors so that through Jonah, the sailors would be introduced to God. Because notice, right after their response, that's when now we turn back to Jonah who's sinking toward the bottom of the sea. Now the sailors are not the only group of people God showed compassion upon in this story, right? Who's another group that he showed compassion upon? The, the Ninevites themselves, right? The Assyrians. Through their belief in God, you know, God could have let them continue on in their false God-worshipping ways and their violence and wickedness. He could have let them go and suffer eternal judgment justly. But instead, he sends this guy Jonah 
to get their attention. And they respond in belief. And God then, it says in verse 10 of chapter 3, he, he relents from the disaster he, he was going to bring. He shows mercy. And even more than that, I believe that these Ninevites came to know him. It says they believed in God, trusted in him. That's a, a reference to someone that has genuine faith. And we see that in how they respond. And so God shows compassion upon the Ninevites. He shows compassion upon the sailors. There's someone else in this story that receives his compassion as well. Jonah himself. Right? We see it initially as when Jonah was thrown into the Mediterranean as he's sinking to the bottom of the sea, this great fish comes up and swallows him. Now think about this. If God wanted to punish Jonah, it wouldn't have been a fish that swallowed him. It would have been a great white shark that ate him. But that's not what happened. God rescued him, actually, from drowning. And he used the most unique life vest in human history, probably the most smelly one, too. But then, in verse 2 of chapter 2, Jonah says, I cried out to you in my distress, and you heard me. See, as he was sinking to the bottom, what was Jonah saying? Save me, God. Help me. Don't let me die. And God, in his mercy, answered that. And God shows compassion on Jonah, not just one time in this story, but twice. With the fish, and then again in chapter 4. Look with me at verse 4. Continues on, right? Jonah says he's, he wants to die, and the Lord said to him, Do you do well? Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, made a booth for himself there. Jonah didn't even answer God's question. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad about the plant. But when dawn came, upon the, uh, came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to live than to die. I'll stop there a minute. So we learn here. Jonah was so angry, he stomps out of the city. God asks him a question. He ignores God, goes to the east of the city, and sits out there in the heat, builds himself a little shelter, and he stomps out of the city there to, to be there to pout, basically. And then God shows his kindness by bringing up this plant to go over Jonah's head, and scholars argue what kind of plant it was. doesn't really matter. It was, had leaves large enough to shade him, okay? And it comes up over his head, and the important issue wasn't the kind of plant it was, but why God provided that plant. It seems that he was giving shelter, right? He was again showing mercy to Jonah, giving him shelter from the heat. And again, this is in Mosul, Iraq, which can get up to 130 degrees or more, especially when the scorching winds come through there. So again, it seems that God is showing kindness to Jonah here. Notice in verse 6 it says that he grew up, the plant grew up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head. So earlier, God had rescued Jonah from being drowned by sending the fish, and now it seems he's rescuing Jonah from heat stroke by providing this shade. Or is something else going on here? Notice there's a second purpose statement in verse 6. He grew the plant over Jonah's head to be a shade for him and also to save him from his discomfort. Now at first that might sound like the same thing. Actually, it is not. It's an odd expression, to save him from his discomfort. Now, those of you, if you're using the uh, ESV Pew Bible there, or maybe if you have an ESV translation, look at the footnote for verse 6. What does it say there for the word discomfort? It says there, or his evil. Huh. We'll come back to that. And here's where we get to the heart of the story. Here's where we get to the purpose of this book, really. Because see, you see here, uh, God was more interested not in rescuing Jonah's body from the heat of the sun, but in rescuing his heart from the heat of his hatred and racism and self-righteousness. After God had shown mercy upon the Ninevites, it says there in verse 1 of chapter 4 that it was, uh, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he began became angry. Actually, the literal statement there in the original Hebrew is this. 
that Jonah, it displeased Jonah, and that he was exceedingly angry because he saw this as a great evil. And that word for anger there is, is the idea of irate, furious. Not just he's mad because he stubbed his toe. He was livid. And he says it was so angry that he wanted to die. I mean, that's angry. And you know, here's another irony here. Uh, there's another prophet named Elijah. said the same words, actually, back after his uh, meeting with the prophets of Baal and he's out in the desert. Remember that? He said the same thing. He said to God, I want to die. Why? Because in that case, he realized that even though the prophets of Baal were dead, Queen Jezebel and King Ahab were still on the throne, and so Baal worship was going to continue. And so he said, what's the point? Just take me out and die. I want to die right now. But what's ironic is that prophet Elijah wanted to die because the people did not turn to Yahweh. Here, Jonah, the prophet, wants to die because the people did turn to Yahweh. This guy is something else. And so God asked him, do you have a right to be angry? What is your problem, man? And this question exposes Jonah's heart. Jonah walks away. He doesn't even answer the Lord. Verse 5 says he went out of the city, sat down there somewhere east of it. Now, why did he do that? Why did he just, you know what, fine, I did what you said, I'm heading back home. Why did he go and sit outside the city of Nineveh? Knowing where his heart was at at that point, what do you think he was hoping for? Maybe these people, they'll go back to their wicked ways and God's going to torture them. I think that's what he was up doing out there. Why else would he have stayed? And especially in the heat and discomfort. He hated these people. He wanted them to be judged. And there's another irony in this story because it describes Jonah as in his arrogance sitting down outside of the city hoping that the city will burn while at that very moment inside the city the king rises up in humility hoping God would spare the city. The pagan king is the humble one in this story, not the prophet of God. And again, before you think there's been a change in Jonah's heart, just because he went to Nineveh the second time, don't think that meant that, God, that Jonah had changed in his attitudes. Actually, notice it says there in verse 3, the city was a three days journey. How long did Jonah stay in there? One day. I think what he did was simply he enters into the west gate because he's coming from the west, he goes through the city one day, crying out this mini-sermon, 40 days, and then it will be destroyed. He leaves through the east gate, right on through the city, goes up on the hill to wait and hope that these people would still receive judgment. Jonah's actions may have changed, but his heart had not. Again, that's why we have chapter 4. I, take, I want to go back to verse 1 of chapter 4 again, because I think there's something here that you need to understand. It's a little harder to see in the English but again, basically that phrase where it says it displeased Jonah exceedingly, literally it is, it was an evil to Jonah, a great evil. What was an evil? The it there refers to God's response of mercy. Right when God showed that mercy, it says it was a great evil to Jonah, a very great evil. Think about that for a minute. Jonah believed that by showing mercy, God was committing an evil, a great evil. Now that word evil is key in this story. It's the Hebrew word ra'ah. Normally I don't get into the, this, but I think it's important to understand that because the author uses that word ra'ah throughout this story to weave it together. Go back to the very first verse, verse 1, or verse 2, excuse me, where Jonah was sent because the evil, the ra'ah of the Ninevites had come up before God. And then in verse 7, the sailors said, let us cast lots so that we can see on whose account this evil has struck us. Now that word ra'ah can be, it means evil either in some, what someone does or what happens to a person. So it can be translated as disaster, calamity, wickedness, evil, something like that. So the sailors, they say, let's learn on whose account this evil has come upon us. And then they repeat it again in verse 8. Then later in chapter 3, after hearing Jonah's message, the king of Nineveh says in verse 8, that each person may turn from his ra'ah. And then in verse 10, it says that God relented concerning the ra'ah which he had declared he would bring upon them. 
And then in verse 1, if this was seen by Jonah as Ra'ah. And then in verse 6, don't miss this, God brought a plan to deliver Jonah to save him from his Ra'ah. You see what's happening here? This word connects the entire story together. Who was it ultimately that needed to be delivered from his evil? Yeah, you know, um, one commentator said this, the greatest evil in the book is Jonah. <laughs> Martin Luther said Jonah was worse than the Ninevites because he tried to keep heaven from them. You cannot get any worse than that. And so when God brings this plant, he wants to use this plant not to, to give Jonah a relief from the heat, but to use it as an object lesson to get to Jonah's heart, to show him how different his heart is from God's heart. Now, when the plant first grew, right, verse 6 says that Jonah rejoiced a great rejoicing. He was very happy, but then the next day, God brings a, a worm along, something that chews up the plant so that it dies. Then the, God brings that scorching east wind. It's probably 130 plus. And so Jonah there, he's getting overheated, probably on the verge of heat stroke, and he says, God, I want to die. This is it. Second time. And so God asks him a question again. Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah needs to hear questions twice, it seems, in this story. And now Jonah answers. And he says, I missed my plan. Now he cares about something. He didn't care about the Ninevites, whether they perished. He honestly didn't care about the sailors, right? He's in the storm sleeping, and they say, cry out to your God, and Jonah doesn't even do that. He refused to want God to save Nineveh, yet this same prophet comes to the point of wanting to die because of a plant and what it was doing for him. In this whole story, everyone's concerned about people except Jonah. And here's where we come to the point of this story. Here's where the author brings it together in verse 10 of chapter 4. Look with me there. And the Lord said, You pity, or had compassion, on the plant, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came in, be, into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and almost as much cattle? And then the story ends. But wait a minute. What kind of story is this? What happened to Jonah? What did he do? Did he answer God's question? Did he repent? Did he continue on in his, his hateful ways? What happened? We're not given the answer to that. The author's been drawing us in. And he masterfully flips this story on us because that question ultimately is not intended for Jonah. It's intended for you and me, the reader. There's no answer because the author wants us to think about this. You see, it's easy to get on Jonah's case, and I guess rightly so, as we're going through the story. You just, one more thing after another, or the thing he says, the thing he does, you're going, man, how can a person be more evil? <laughs> To not even care or have compassion? And here, in this last verse, God says, I have compassion for lost souls. How about you? You know, we can get so caught up criticizing this prophet that we forget to look at ourselves as we look at this story. Because listen, when you or I treat someone else with contempt because they're different than us, we're, we're like Jonah. When... Uh, we turn a blind eye to the many needs around us. We are like Jonah. When we don't pray for lost souls around us, when we don't take opportunity to share the gospel with them, we're like Jonah. When I'm not concerned with those who are in foreign lands who are perishing, I'm like Jonah. When I would wish God's judgment on someone else, the Taliban, ISIS, Atheists, I am Jonah. When I don't care whether another person goes to heaven and hell, I'm Jonah. I remember a woman who came into my office uh, years ago for, <clears throat> she was struggling with her boss. 
struggling at work. He was very harsh, uh, just not fun to work for. Anyone else identify with that? Um, and she hated him. And so as she's telling me what was going on, I, I asked her a question. I said, well, who's this person out with the Lord? Do you think he knows Jesus? Because I'm trying to get, okay, let's look at the bigger picture here. She says, I don't, I don't care. I don't know and I don't care. I said, really? You realize if this person does not know the Lord Jesus, he's on a path to hell. So what? Couldn't believe it. I mean, she's being honest. But it kind of... <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, at times I think we can get there if we're not careful. Where we really don't care about the eternal state of those around us. And maybe we wouldn't express it that way. But if we're honest with ourselves, this story is given for us to think about that. Do we have the same heart of God? Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with their arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Jesus said in Luke 6.36, Be merciful, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's what Jonah shows us. Look at God's mercy all throughout that story. Even on a bigoted, self-righteous, angry prophet. Listen, as we look upon God's heart, as we understand who God is, what he has done, as we see examples like this of his compassion, listen, that is what will motivate us to follow his example. Not guilt or shame or if you don't win enough souls and you know, you're going to be in trouble. Or No, it's all about our Father has compassion. Lord, give me that same compassion. How does that get stilled in our hearts? By the work of the Spirit as we read stories like this. As we see God at work and see His mercy. You know, <clears throat> God did have compassion on the sailors, on the Ninevites, on Jonah. And He's had compassion on you and me. You know, again, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we're like those Ninevites. You know how wide his mercy is, is upon us? From Christ's right hand to his left. The only way you and I could escape the judgment that we deserve, the same judgment the Ninevites deserve, the same judgment Jonah deserved, the same judgment that all people deserve because all have rejected God and turned away from him, the only way we could be rescued from that is because of what Jesus has done. Taking upon himself the payment you and I deserve, <laughs> rightly. He paid a debt that you and I could not pay. The hymn writer, Frederick Faber, said this, there's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. And in that mercy, God brought someone or some people in your life to share with you that mercy and what he has done on your behalf if you would put your trust in him. And that's, I don't know all of you here. I know some of you, getting to know some of you. I don't know what brought you here this morning. I don't know where you're at with the Lord Jesus Christ. You do. But I, I want you to honestly take this moment and think about, do you truly know him? Have you genuinely put your trust in Jesus Christ alone? As was read earlier, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. God will show mercy upon you just like he did on the Ninevites, just like he did on the sailors and even Jonah himself. But it requires that we put our trust in him. It requires that we desire to turn away from our life of sin and rebellion and turn toward Christ. And listen, there's not a God with an angry fist going to punch you first when you turn to him, no, it's a God with arms open wide in mercy. Just like he showed those Ninevites. We, again, we cannot imagine the degree of compassion God showed those people because of all the things they had done. But at the same time, you and I aren't much different. 
Maybe we didn't impale people on poles and, and scalp them and do things like that, cut their skin off. But certainly, we've committed murder in our hearts. Certainly, we have showed hatred to others. Certainly, we have done many things that have brought shame, embarrassment to our Lord. And yet, He will forgive if we would cry to Him. So listen, please. If you have not yet done that, or if you're evaluating your life and saying, you know, I'm not sure that I have, I want to ask you, plead with you. Cry out for mercy, and God will hear. But if you walk away, there will come a point, point when later on, those Ninevites, about 100 years later, the next generation turned away from God, and then he rose up another prophet named, named Nahum, who did bring a message of judgment, and that judgment took place. So don't, don't turn away from God's voice now if he's speaking to you. But listen, let me pray. I want to give you a moment to think about this. Think about one, if you're not sure if you know him or if you don't know him, take a moment to ask yourself, Lord, please forgive me. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. If you do know him, I want to give you this moment to think about compassion. And the Lord shows us compassion. How about you? Take a moment, pray to yourself, and then I will close. Pray with yourself, and then I will close. <clears throat> oh, Lord, if anything is clear from your word, it is that you... You are a God of mercy. That you are a just and holy God. And at the same time, one full of compassion. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so, Lord, I would first ask, please, this morning, if there are any here, Lord, who have not taken that step of faith, put their trust in you and you alone, to receive the forgiveness because of what your son has done on the cross and because he rose again to show that you accepted his sacrifice, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be at work in those hearts and that they would desire to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. I too, Lord, want to pray for those of us who, Lord, have received faith and repentance and are walking with you, following you, that you would Stir in our hearts compassion for those who have not yet done so, that you would use the story in Jonah even that, that just shows your compassion in such amazing ways that that example would stir our own hearts. Even as you said in Ephesians that as beloved children walk in love just as you have loved us. So may we do that, Lord, by showing compassion to those around us, especially in bringing them the message and, Lord, supporting those who go abroad with that message. And even perhaps for some of us, Lord, stir in our hearts if you would desire that we would be those that would go to other lands. God, ultimately, we want to look like Jesus because that was what would most glorify him on this earth. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name, on his behalf, and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together, and we're going to close our time together here uh, with a great chorus from a, a song that many times we sing uh, at Christmas time, and I think it's very appropriate, Catherine, that you you chose this as it goes well with Tim's message. Go tell it on the mountain, and you perhaps have a mountain in your community, a mountain in your neighborhood, a mountain at work, that you can go and tell them that Jesus Christ is born and he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Let's sing together as Catherine leads us.
given us the commission to go and to tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. He is Lord of Lords and he is King of Kings. Father, we ask that you would show us, Lord, how that we can talk about Jesus, how we can speak about Jesus, how we can glorify you in all that we say and do. Father, we thank you for the ministry of Tim and Tina Carnes. We thank you, Father, for the pastors that they are reaching around the world, especially the pastors in Pakistan that are experiencing persecution, uh, suffering. And Lord, we ask that you continue to give uh, Tim and Tina wisdom as they minister in this area. Lord, thank you for their time with us this weekend. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you've given to each one of us to speak up about Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.